Right, so you came to England in 1962 to Cambridge. Yes. To read mathematics? To read mathematics, because at that time still I was (coughs) planning, if that's the right word to use, it wasn't a very deliberate thought, to be a theoretical physicist. And here, as you know, the theoretical physicists are drawn from the maths department, applied Mm. maths department. Mm. But did you enjoy mathematics? I enjoyed certain parts of mathematics, and the applied bits. Pure mathematics never interested me much, but I had to do quite a bit. Wikipedia suggests that you didn't do as well as... No, no, I was... But I wasn't particularly interested in it also. Mm. I got more and more interested in social issues. Mm. That was during the period of the um, Vietnam War. Mm. So my best friends were... Uh, closest friends at that time were social scientists. And well, were, which college were you at? I was at Trinity. Mm-hmm. So you had some pretty good mathematicians teaching you. Oh yes, excellent ones. Mm. Was there anyone who taught you who you particularly influenced you either? Yes, uh, Swinton Dyer, I think. Oh. He was uh, he was my supervisor for some time, and then he was also my dean, dean mm. of college. Mm. I got to know him subsequently very well. Mm. I s- well, what was he like? I've, I've interviewed him. But he was thing. exceptionally deep as a mind. I thought uh, I liked his style of inquiry. He seemed to be interested in a number of things which he could connect. Hmm. Um, I, enjoy, I mean, I admire that a lot, and I try and do it myself. So I think he had a. I won't say he had a great influence on me, but I liked his style very much. Hmm. Did you try and solve the Swinton Dyer conjecture? Oh, no, I wouldn't even know what it is. It's, uh, <laughs> as I say, I'm not a pure mathematician mm. uh, at heart at all, mm. and, but I had to do some, and he taught me a bit of it. He was also a very good poker player, wasn't he? Yes, he's that, but he's also, he mm. also knows quite a bit of theoretical physics, so mm. he could make connections mm. uh, in conversations in a way which I admired. Mm. Did, did Trinity seem a strange place after Delhi? Oh yes, indeed it did. I was so I was. You have to remember, I read. Uh, I read Burton Russell a lot mm-hmm. before coming uh, here at college. Uh, he was, he influenced me a great deal, mm-hmm. enormous amount, enormously. I think next to my father, I would say Russell had a, mm-hmm. the biggest influence on my way of approaching problems skepticism I guess mm. I like to think I'm a softer person than he was so mm. my skepticism has been always allied to some a kind of affection that I th- suspect he didn't quite have but mm. I never met him I can't say for sure but um, I, th- I was greatly influenced by him and of course he wrote a great n- number of autobiographical essays mm. as you know so I knew something about Cambridge long mm. before I came here. So when I arrived, I thought everybody around the street, in the streets was a genius. <laughs> so for about a whole week, I didn't go into hall. I was so scared. <laughs> but eventually I had to. Mm. In those days, hall was compulsory. I was paying for it, mm. so it would be absurd not to. And as it happened, I met, I think, the first afternoon, for our, our first lunch, uh, Francis Cripps, who is a joint, mm. and we sat. Uh, he came and sat next to me, and we became the closest of friends. Uh, this is Cripps, yeah. not Crick. <laughs> no Cripps. Cripps. This is the yeah. uh, grandson of Sir Stafford Cripps, mm. and he was quite devastatingly brilliant. Mm. So, in some se- some ways, my suspicion was confirmed, mm. and yet because he became a very good friend, mm. I could live with it. Mm. Live with the fact that. Uh, these were exceptional talents all around me. Mm. So you were happy in your... Yes and no. I didn't get much out of uh, undergraduate life here. Mm. I didn't get much out of undergraduate life in Delhi either, by the way. Mm. I think I had about a seven-year spell Mm. since leaving my school I was, Mm. uh, was talking to you about when I didn't really grow very much. I did. Sounds if you, maybe you were mature quite young and then stayed on a plateau at a sort of Who knows? Mid- middling maturity. Who knows? Mm. But uh, nothing really 
mm. overly excited me. I think I, I, I must have been acquiring knowledge you know, mm. and expertise without consciously doing so. Mm. But um, I was, it was fine, but I wasn't. Um, but were you involved in left-wing politics? You said that Vietnam. No, no, I wasn't that at all. I took part in some marches in mm. London against the Vietnam War, but that's not left wing. It was yeah. just a very. I was there too. <laughs> it was a very reasonable thing Gro to do. Grosvenor Square. Right, yeah. That's right. Mm. We probably were at the yes. same time. <laughs> yeah. Were there any other friends who from that undergraduate period? Yes, I ha I have um, several who have remained very close friends. Francis left England, so I haven't really seen much of mm. him for 20 years, although we kept in touch. Simon Blackburn and I were very close, really? and we are, we continue to be close. Mm. Um, I certainly like to think I encouraged him a lot to get back here from the United States some years mm. ago. I, when the chair was advertised, I remember mm. writing to him to say, wouldn't it be a good idea to grow all together, and mm. so forth. Um, and we see him quite a lot. He and I and Christopher Garrett, who is a very distinguished oceanographer, mathematician, mm. oceanographer, uh, we were exact contemporaries, all three of us, and we saw a great deal of each other. Mm. Um, but he left uh, England a few years after he mm. completed his PhD. But we keep in touch. He's mm. in Canada, mm. but we still in touch and see each other every now and then when he's here. Uh, that was a, a very powerful group of friends. One a philosopher, another mathematician, and Francis the economist. And uh, you mentioned drama. I mean, there were, there were no theatres in, well, not that you knew of in Delhi, but Cambridge had exactly, quite and, a tradition. And I used to go to the arts quite frequently. Mm, but you never acted or? No. Yeah. Okay, well, let's move on to what did you do next? Did you do a PhD? Or? Yes, I went straight to, after my part three mm. of the maths tri um, tripos, I moved to doing economics mm. in the sense that there was at that time a conversion course called a diploma in mm. economics. So uh, one of the economists at Trinity was James Murleys, who I knew mm. through a different channel. We were members of a discussion group in Cambridge. So he encouraged me to do economics, given the interest I'd shown in, on social issues in those discussions. So I uh, enrolled in economics, and um, this must have been 1965. So there was a diploma I could have gone for, which is a exam at the end of the academic year, followed by another six months, you submit a dissertation. But uh, I must have done reasonably well in the exams, so Merleys asked me whether I shouldn't just, for, shouldn't just forget about the diploma and do a straight PhD. He had done maths before going to economics. Mm. I had the same way, so I thought he would be the natural person to work with, so I did. Mm. And in the event, I finished my PhD, I think, in 18 months. So Gosh. It must, I, I think it's probably a record. Uh, mm. I got my PhD in, in June. 68, and having started in October 66. So it is a very quick. So that was. That and was he was your supervisor? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's good because I've interviewed him. And yes, he's a. <laughs> and Simon Blackburn, so it's uh, yeah. all the connections. Um, what was the subject of the PhD? Uh, I worked on what many people were working on, so it wasn't a very uh, novel topic. Uh, but it sort of suited my my uh, interest at that time, but it, it largely because other people had been working on it, so I was reading around it. It was on how to think about what to do now if you have an infinite future ahead of you, given that today's decision affect tomorrow and so forth and so on. In some sense, you have to build the whole of your infinite life to today. Now, that sounds a weird problem for an economist to think about, but these were the days when national planning was very important mm. in India and elsewhere. Mm. And um, if, even if people are mortal, you don't, you don't like to admit that your nation is mortal. Mm. So 
even though you talk about five-year plans or 25-year plans, really speaking, you should be thinking about uh, the whole of the future, if you like. And um, a great Cambridge mathematician stroke economist, Frank Ramsey, who I believe in this college. Yes, and you, you have the Frank Ramsey chair. Yeah, he wrote the first great article on the subject, mm. sort of defined the problem. So the, I worked on that, and that's not very novel. A lot of people were working on it, but I did something which nobody else had done at that time, which was on a very novel problem, which was to combine um, decisions about consumption and savings with decision for procreation. Mm. So how many people there would be tomorrow was a decision problem rather than being taken as a fact, mm. uh, as a datum as Frank Ramsey and his followers have done. So that was novel, and um, it's still, I think, one of my best papers. It's certainly one of the one papers that are very often referred to by people when they talk about my work. So I like to think it was, it st stood the test of time, if that's <laughs> how you call it. And it's a subject which you're still, I mean, you're patron of the optimum population. Can't yeah, you? I have, um, I've, I've kept, well, the reason for it is that the reason I'm still interested in it is because within about two, three years, I decided the way I had framed the problem was wrong. Mm -hmm. And the way I had framed the problem was not dissimilar, in fact, it was identical to the way my father-in-law, James Mead, had thought about it. Mm -hmm. And prior to... James Mead is your father-in-law? Uh, yes, oh. indeed. And prior to that, mm -hmm. uh, Henry Sidgwick had mm -hmm. thought about it. These are the only economists and philosophers who had actually explicitly wrote about optimum population. Mm -hmm. So the moment they wrote about it, they created, a, if you like, an informal model mm -hmm. in which they thought about the matter. I hadn't actually read them when I formulated my model, but it turned out to be very similar to theirs. Mm -hmm. In fact, identical in some ways. But of course, I had some results which they hadn't, so mm -hmm. that gave it a, if you like, some value added to my exercise. But I started having doubts about it. So off and on, I have worked on the problem and um, intertemporal issues or justice among generations is something which has interested me since my graduate student days and a part of my work right through my academic life has been in that on that problem area but of course the many many sub problems that arise out of thinking about justice among generations but if one topic has been constant in my academic um, life, it's been that. Justice between generations. Yeah. Which Peter Laslett also was very interesting. Indeed, in. and I have a paper in the most recent uh, vintage of a series that Peter Laslett mm, started. With, Ronson, with Gary Ronson. Yeah, yeah, this one, the latest is edited by James Fishkin and mm. Robert Gooden. Mm. Uh, Fishkin's at Stanford, Gooden's mm. at ANU in Canberra. But it's in the same series. Mm -hmm. um, and this one is on population and, and uh, po political theory. I mean, just staying with population a moment, um, as someone involved with the Optimum Population Council, um, I've just been reading some reviews recently of a book by Fre Fred, someone, who basically says that Malthus was rubbish and that we have no problem and uh, you know, yeah. we're heading for definitely for nine billion and we can cope with that and it's all been hyped and exaggerated and so on and so on. What, what are your feelings about the current status of Malthus and the world, world population? Right. Uh, uh, it's a, it's a it's a uh, tricky question because it really deserves a very long answer, but I haven't got the, we haven't got the time. Well, I, so I, have the longer be the, the better, because my wife is very interested in right, this too. Right. I think most of these anti-Malthusian writings are, are rubbish. And they're rubbish for a very good reason. They essentially make a caricature out of what she was about. Then they do a very selected amount of economic data mining. Now, if, you're, if, you're, if you believe that the level of economic activity in the world depends not only on per capita economic activity, but also on the number, so the two together go, so mm. it's, not, it's not simply high consumption, 
mm. with high consumption per person, mm. plus a lot of people, as it were. And if you think that that is causing stress on Earth's system, if you believe that, and if you don't believe that it's not causing stress on Earth's system, then you're basically rejecting a great deal of ecology, mm. a great deal of environmental sciences, a great deal of climate science, the whole lot. So if you believe that it is causing stress, then the issue isn't really whether Malthus got it right or wrong. Who cares whether mm. he got it right or wrong? But the question is whether these were interesting and important issues to think about, which is, are there unintended consequences each of us has on others now and others in the future by our decisions on consumption, work and reproduction. And there are a great deal of my own work has been in trying to find the unintended consequences that are probably there. Uh, some of them arise interestingly out of a lack of well-defined markets. So uh, when you say that in a poor country you need children as substitutes for old age pension or substitutes for labor-saving devices, which we say all the time by the way, then you might think that there is a pronatalist drive here which is perfectly rational from the individual household point of view. It's not that they're stupid or that they're culturally backward or anything like that. But there are unintended consequences on others arising out of the need to have many hands. So this obsession of trying to show Malthus was wrong strikes me as being a bogus exercise. Um, Malthus was unfortunate, he wrote about the time the Industrial Revolution took off. So of course what people have in mind is the fact that people are living longer, uh, people are better off, you name it, and people seem to be doing better now than they did a hundred years ago. So what's all this bitching about mm. overpopulation? The problem is that the unintended consequences could be over, say, the fact that you're trashing Earth, the planet, in the process of doing this. Now, if you count that damage in, then things don't look all that well necessarily. And one of my uh, research projects over the past 25 years has been to try and tease out from the data how much of trashing we have been doing to Earth in the process of economic growth and increased longevity. All these are good things, of course. All of these are good things. So it's not as though you're pointing to phony gains. The question is, are there serious losses waiting in the, for the future which uh, we're not taking into account and therefore in some sense there's a trade-off that we are insisting on through our actions between the today and the tomorrow and the day after which is what comes back to the issue of justice upon generation so today most people would balk a little bit before trashing Malthus when you mentioned climate change because that's the name of the game at the moment. But there are other problems too, oceans, uh, amongst other things. So there are large numbers of natural for resources which we have trashed, which are beginning to reveal problems. And they're not going to happen in one big swoop, by the way. But we could be facing, we are facing catastrophes. Now, in my way of thinking, one reason this literature is extremely mischievous is that it inevitably sees everything in global terms. The world hasn't collapsed. On average, people are improving, and so forth. But like you anthropologists, I like to think small beer, if you like. And cata natural catastrophes, or catastrophes, that are not acts of God have happened regularly in the poor world. Villages get wiped out through devastation which are not locusts or bad rainfall only. Those you have historical records of. 
but denuded forests, water supplies running out. And you then see tensions as the productivity of the natural capital around villages starts declining. Social tensions increase. So again, the social scientist, if you want to avoid natural capital, talking about natural capital, you can do so by saying, well, actually, the cause isn't that. The cause is bad governance. Or it's not overpopulation. It's bad governance. Or they're fighting each other. Well, you might ask, why are they fighting each other? Or could bad governance itself be a symptom of social tensions arising? Now, none of these is an easy, easy thing to answer. But to pretend that there's one variable which we can safely ignore because it's politically correct to think so today strikes me as being bad social science. Because warfare is not exogenously given, there are also there are tensions which lead to them, civil wars. Uh, the diminution of natural capital, increased desertification, loss of topsoil, loss of um, forest cover um, are not accidental happenings. They are a consequence of choices made by millions of people. And I think good social science should be open-minded to enough to be able to, to ask whether it's possible for individuals to be reasonably rational in their decisions, and yet collectively things go awry. And I think um, for that reason, I think Yes, the population rates in sub-Saharan Africa, unquestionably in my mind, has been very high, but you can't fault it to individual Africans. So sometimes these problems then become a call of worth. They say, oh, it actually is poverty the problem, not population. Well, the problem is poverty and population are both endogenous variables in, in the sense that you and I recognize them. They're all consequences of the past, um, and they're related. It'll be, it's not an accident that the very poor in Africa have larger families than the rich in England. Both have a rationale behind them. One leads them to an outcome which is a kind of a trap out of which is very hard for villages to come out of or households to come out of, almost like a vicious circle. Now, if whether that's Malthusian or not is totally uninteresting to me. It's the question is whether it's a correct way of thinking about the problem. It's a subject which interests me, but um, uh, so I'll just ask a couple more questions yep. around it. One is um, some of the um, remarks you made at the beginning about the unintended consequences sounded like the work of E.J. Michan on externalities. Yes, these are externalities. Oh, yes, I was avoiding that expression because but that's the, a technical that, that's term. That's what it is, really, yeah. yeah. The second is that um, in the 70s, um, one of the most powerful counter-arguments to, to, to Malthus was the work of Esther Bezrop, yeah. um, which reduced oversimplified hugely, basically said that we um, will not face huge problems because human beings are very inventive and um, as the population grows they will discover new technologies which will alleviate the problem and she admitted that mm. sometimes it didn't seem to happen unfortunately but usually we will work our way out of it mm -hmm which is similar to some of these recent critiques, because basically, as you say, they said, well, Malthus didn't see the Industrial Revolution, nor did Adam Smith, of course, but, um, and so now we have technology and science which will solve the problems. I wonder what you... Well, well this is crystal ball, of course, so it's hard to, I mean, these are irrefutable remarks, mm. so, oh, so it's, uh, <coughs> but one can nevertheless address them because I have to then say, despite that, why might I be concerned about these matters? Mm. One of them is that um, science and technology 
or even capitalism for that matter. One, sometimes you just say that we've discovered capitalism, so mm. that unleashes the, the mm. creative juices of societies <laughs> and so forth. So let's go with that route for mm. that matter. Neither capitalism nor science and technology can fool nature. Uh, there are certain aspects of nature which just cannot be mm. certain laws some principles, and this I'm not talking now about this first and second and third laws of thermodynamics, I'm talking mm. about ecological principles, mm. uh, that biodiversity has some buffering offers some buffering capacity to ecosystems. Now, th that's not a law, but it's a kind of a uh, something that has been discovered over a 40-year research period. Um, we've begun to discover, or at least scientists have begun to discover, these tipping phenomena of systems which tip over from one state of to another which is very hard to reverse back. Climate is beginning to look as though it's one of those things which is going to be like of that sort. Now it's hard to know what you mean by science and technology solving the problem when you have a tipping phenomenon which can kick a system whether it's a village or whether it's a district or whether it's a country or whether it's the world as a whole. Uh, in a matter of 10, 15, 20 years, when your s solution must be uh, of a kind which is, uh, which can't accept such a accelerated deterioration. So if, if we're told currently, for example, I think the nearest would be climate change because that's been so much, so widely discussed. If the temp mean temperature goes up to two, three degrees beyond what it is now, well, it's a regime we haven't, Earth hasn't experienced in over a million years. So it's hard to s envisage even uh, what kind of forces will unleash in some parts of the world, not in all parts of the world. All the models that we have seem to suggest there will be very uneven distribution of burdens that will fall on various parts of the world on account of climate change. Um, it, it's, a, um, it's, it's a kind of an argument which is very hard to put together uh, when somebody says science and technology will solve it. Science and technology hasn't solved, has solved some problems very nicely. But it wasn't, the science and technology wasn't there saying there is world poverty, let's solve it. It didn't quite happen that way. At least that's not my reading of the, the Industrial Revolution. There was money to be made. Mm. Uh, there was a good deal of cheap uh, raw materials out there can be converted and ingenious methods were found to increase the productivity of capital. No question. And productivity of labor. No question about it. Um, But before all else, we need serious institutional reform before science and technology can get going because scientists and technologists are going to be, well, technologists certainly are going to be influenced by relative prices, whereas a profit, profitable opportunity. And if nature is priced at a very low level, then why would we expect innovations to be friendly towards nature? One reason why innovations in the past, through the, throughout the Industrial Revolution, has been particularly rapacious in its use of nature, is that nature came free. So you solved one class of problems in raising agricultural productivity, industrial, uh, industrial productivity, but you did that by saying that the cost to nature, or the cost to us, by virtue of the fact that nature was being diminished, or natural capital was being eroded is negligible. So there is a kind of an illusion that we suffer from by doing wrong accounting of the economy. Uh, and again, the issue really is over the today versus the tomorrow. In some cases, of course, it's the haves today versus the have nots today. But some of the interesting questions also appear at the inter intergenerational level. So, I can't disprove people the back of an envelope that science and technology will not solve problems. But it depends on what the problems are and what the motivations to technologists are. 
we economists like to believe that nature should be priced a lot higher than it is now because it's it's not priced for the main part and that's been a problem uh, and that's been a problem which has spillovers in many fields of activity not just savings and consumption but technological progress and fertility behavior to come back to what we were discussing uh, they're not independent of one another and so we might be going through or we have some reasons for thinking that when I say we I don't mean the world as a whole it's, I think it's not very helpful to think all the time just globally and saying well we are here a lot of people are richer now so what are you complaining about and I think it makes great sense to see the world's poor which that category is very sticky that number doesn't seem to disappear that easily as a sort of a prism through which we can look at what we are doing to earth because some of the worst devastations of nature have occurred in the poorest countries uh, and not because they don't care not because they're stupid that's not the issue sheer survival may have required or would one can argue has required of them to behave in a particular way or take decisions in a way which in recent years has been quite devastating for them and prior to that of course there was the colonial past which has a history of its own regarding the exploitation of nature so when England ran out of a resource in place X it could go to place Y and then when place Y was wiped out could go to place Z but if you live in a village in Africa and your forests are denuded your water supply has through over extraction uh, dried up where do you go do you then say all right X is over let's migrate to Y that's not an offer you get killed uh, I find the prismatic way of looking at problems the way your profession does very helpful uh, I think the big picture is very misleading I think the small picture is the one which tells us a lot at least I can't think in big picture terms thank you um, I often ask people to kind of imagine themselves looking back on their own work and picking out of it two or three uh, things they've done which they're particularly glad to have done um, I mean you to a certain extent you've covered it the, the theme that you're interested in already but if you had to kind of write your own Wikipedia article on what, why your work was important and what what you contributed to economics and development economics what, what would you select out I don't know uh, I'm not given to too much introspection on these matters. Um, I'm not sure if I know what is my important work. I don't even know if they are important. <laughs> um, most economic, uh, most academics feel not many people read them anyway, so we suffer from that mm. neurosis. I think mm. we all do, and I certainly suffer from it but on the other hand I sometimes at my more rational moments interpret that saying maybe it wasn't a great article after all that's why I don't people read it <laughs> so I would find it very difficult to say what's good or, uh, you see I haven't ever had a research agenda uh, I have never been an ambitious researcher in the sense that I see many of my colleagues or certainly some of my co-authors who are extremely distinguished people have had their, their central goal they had they wanted to crack certain types of problems, the chase problems and so forth. I can't uh, r recall ever having that kind of uh, attitude. Um, it may have been my early background which was easy going and um, friendship has mattered a great deal in my life. Oh, a lot of my best work I guess or most cited work, that's the best way of thinking about it I guess, have been with others. And they've been with others largely because they were friends. And 
like you and I are chatting now, we would be chatting and the problem would arise and we would then go away and maybe drip, do some um, writing and some calculations and then come back to each other and before you knew what was happening two years, three years down the road, an article would emerge. With one co-author, I've had papers which have taken a dozen years before between start and finish. Now in today's world, that's say unthinkable delay in today's world in economics that is mm. these are it's not like the golden bow right i mean mm. it's the theorem <laughs> somebody else might pip you and mm -hmm. take away the credit and so forth but i've never been i've never felt very urgent about doing my work i've never had a feeling that i can make a difference or anything like that i have no such illusions yeah um, i enjoy chasing problems in it if something strikes me I enjoy that great, great deal, and I'm pretty good at it, I guess. Certainly, editors must think I'm pretty good at it, otherwise they wouldn't publish my stuff. And I've been very lucky with publications, very lucky with publications, um, in, in getting things published in major journals. I've never had a problem there. But um, I've never had a big eureka moment. Yeah, I can ask you. I've never, it's not, never been like that. I've, uh, some papers, some ideas of mine which have matured in, to my satisfaction have taken maybe 25 years to do so through, let's say, seven, eight articles. So each is an incremental in improvement on the previous one in terms of my own understanding or, or my way of framing the problem, let alone executing it. Um, I think I understand the social world and I like to think that I understand the social world a lot better now than I did 20 years ago and I like to think that I have taught myself that rather than getting it from somebody else but whether they are important insights into the social world I would not be able to say I, just, that would be presumptuous I've worked on poverty quite a lot because I've tried to understand um, the phenomenon of absolute poverty with the same rigor that colleagues have studied a well-functioning society where people are prosperous. Uh, this is something we were discussing at lunch that I don't feel the one guiding principle that I've had, and again that's not original with me most economists have that, is that um, people are statistically the same everywhere. So that when you see differences, that needs explaining as to why there are differences. Uh, and some of these differences will be sticky, some will be fluid, some of them will take a long time to emerge as differences, some will be fast, so you have to worry about fast-moving variables, medium fast and really super fast and then very slow moving variables and you have to look at the data with this with the discipline of theory to be able to see what might be a slow moving variable what is not so for example many of us would have taken culture not to be an explanatory it would to, to be a if you like not an explanatory variable because we feel that culture needs to be explained as well I mean, cultural differences need to be explained, like habits need to be, differences in habits need to be dis explained, and so forth. But of course, you might then say, oh yes, maybe, but what kind of shoes you wear may be susceptible to change in a much quicker than culture, or what you eat, or something like that. So one has to be sensitive to that, obviously. But the next question is why? Why should some variables be more sticky than others. I mean, if you're a social scientist, the why is never end. <laughs> mm. So, so what I've tried to do, if you, this is a roundabout way of answering your original question. It's not so much a result, but what I have tried to do in a systematic way is to try and put the concerns of anthropologists, the concerns of sociologists, the concerns of geographers, the concerns of ecologists into the same pot 
as that of economist, and I've tried to use that melting pot as a way of trying to understand what's going on in sub sub Saharan Africa, South Asia, Latin America, or parts of Latin America, uh, with the kind of same precision that my colleagues have used for understanding Western liberal democracies, if you like, or the workings of the economies in these Western democracies. Our market economies is mm. that way of putting it. Most of the world I've studied is non-market ones, mm. or, or substantially affected by institutions which are not market, mm. or nor the state. So what's left? Well, communities is one, household is another. And then there are multi-million types of communities. So, can one have a can one have a uh, a not so much an economic theory that the wrong way of putting it, but a common framework for understanding the lives of people in very different socio-ecological surroundings. And the trick is to that's easy. You specify the socio-ecological circumstances and you can then ask what will the household do under those circumstances. The trick, however, the hard bit, is to feed that back onto the evolution of the socio-ecological system and then see how that loop is. That's the hard bit. That's really hard. And I've tried to do that. And, and I think that's the one which I found much, much the most satisfying. And so when I say I understand the social world a lot better now than I did 30 years ago, that's what I meant. How do you work? I mean, you said you don't have eureka moments, um, but most people have moments when they feel that they've had some new important insight. And I'm always curious whether this is when they're going for a walk or in a bath or listening to music or chatting to their friends. I mean, a lot of Cambridge particularly is about conversation and you don't have the idea on your own. You have it through teaching, lecturing, yeah. um, sitting at high table at St. John's occasionally, etc. Um, those moments when suddenly you feel you've taken a step, how, what are the important conditions for your work? I guess all of these have mattered. Um, See, in my case, mostly I work on a particular problem because I have a paper I want to write, a particular problem I'm working on. So conversations <coughs> may revolve around that problem because I might sit next to Jack Goody, as I frequently used to in the 90s when I was writing a big book, so that I could ask him a few questions about household composition or, mm -hmm. or the nature of polygyny and so forth. Now, when he, answer, when he gave me an answer, that didn't mean I had an eureka moment. Mm. It was just another piece mm. that I would then have to use as part of my datum to build a, to write the paper I was doing. So my work has been made almost always paper driven. That is, I have a paper to write because I have a small idea and I think I'll write a paper on it. And in sort of uncharted territories, it's not as though I have a theorem I want to prove. It's not that kind. It's more. Sometimes it's been like that, by the way. There are the except. There's always an exception to it, any <laughs> any statement like this. But mostly, it's been uh, uh, trying to finish a paper. And in order to do that, you read around and you ask people, you talk about it, and little pieces of jigsaw. A jigsaw in the sense of being able to complete the paper, that's all I mean, fall into place. And then before you know what's happening, a paper is finished. And then you look for references and citations and so forth so that you can, mm. can submit it for publication. Um, and that has happened in many, you know, through conversations certainly, at dinners, washing up. At my home I've never had an office, study that is. Uh, I've always worked at home in the dining on the dining table with children in my lap and so forth mm. so noise doesn't affect me uh, 
you know, disturbances don't affect me. They're not disturbances at all. I can, mm. and that's been good, because my parent, my children, our children have never felt that, you know, that is important or anything. He's not. He's mm. his father, and that's it. He's provides laughs. I what guess. children do you have? Really? My wife and I have three children. We have uh, a daughter, a son, and a daughter. They're all mm. grown up now. Mm. And, uh, uh, I like to think that they never felt that they certain times were <coughs> they couldn't make a noise or mm. a certain part of the house was barred from them because father was working there or something. I didn't ever had a study, so mm. uh, which was I think good, but I didn't need one, so it was as simple as that. Or also we couldn't afford one, so that was another. You, uh, you mentioned your father-in-law was an econo- famous economist. Does that mean your wife is also interested in economics? No, she's not. She is a um, she. She's just taken early retirement from the university counselling service. She was a psychotherapist, mm. counsellor, and she had a private practice for some time, but then gave that up to work exclusively for the university's counselling service, and, and she did that for many years. So you don't discuss the economics over breakfast, or no, never have. Not <laughs> not. No. no. Mm. No, I've got two or three more questions, Please. and then um, just see if we've missed out. I mean, there's always too much missing. One is um, about your other aspects of your life. I mean, teaching and administration. Are those things that you're quite enjoy? And, and sure, um, I have no. Pr- I enjoy teaching a lot. I find teaching very easy, actually, and it's never been a big deal for me. Largely because I have never been asked to lecture from a textbook. Mm. So whether I've taught p- prelims or part 1A, I guess, mm. or part 2A or mm. part 2B or mm. MPhil, it's pretty much the same lectures. It's, mm. Some are obviously less technical than the others, depending on which level I'm hitting. And I use a lot of my own work so that I make my teaching really complementary to my mm. Lectures. I mean, I don't uh, lecture out of textbooks. I find it very difficult to do that. If the textbooks are there, the students can jolly well hmm. read the textbooks. There's no no need for me, particularly in Cambridge, because you have a t- tutorial system. Hmm. So it would be pointless for a lecturer to uh, go through. At least to me, it seems hmm. to be pointless to go through course material because there's de- textbooks and there are the tutorials. Hmm. So it seemed to me, if the students are coming to my lectures, they may as well get some ideas of how a researcher studies problems which are part of their syllabus. Mm. So it's been so that's been very easy. Now that doesn't mean that the students necessarily like it, by the way, but on the whole, I get pretty good mm. reports from students. So I think it's been all right. Administration has never been a problem for me. I enjoy that because mm. it's part of my job. But here, um, you never asked me what I thought of. I mean, I st- taught at the London School of Economics for many yes. years. Uh, for many years? Yes, I was there from 1971 to 85, mm. so nearly 14 years. Mm. I thought that was my first appointment mm. there, and then I became a professor there. Mm. And I came here as professor in 1985. Mm. And that was, uh, I had to do some administration, obviously from the word go, because professors expected to do some. but. Um, it was a, that was a very uh, salutary experience because I hated it here. I disliked Cambridge Economics Department intensely. Uh, it was hugely politicized. You hated it there? At, I, it, I mis- misheard you. Where did you hate it? Here, oh. uh, at Cambridge. When I came here, I mean, I, LSE was a dream place, mm. a fantastic place, mm. Economics Department. And in any case, I had joined as a, as a, um, young lecturer, so mm. I grew up there, if you mm. like, and I had some fantastically great senior colleagues who mm. protected me, essentially, mm. in not having me do any administration until I became professor. Mm. The moment I became professor, of course, <laughs> all hell broke loose. You do this, you do that, and so mm. forth. But that was fine, because uh, I had colleagues like Frank Hahn and mm. Terence Gorman and Michio Morishima. These were giants. Uh, mm. Uh, and uh, wonderful colleagues, Dennis Sargon. Uh, so that was fine. And then I come here, and I find that the people 
who were running the place were, I'm afraid, not very good in their subject. Uh, now, Cambridge economics had deteriorated to the extent that it was a laughing stock of the LSE and then Oxford in the United States, but we are sufficiently uh, protected by the nature of the collegiate system from absorbing those pieces of information mm. <laughs> until at least since the RAE started. Mm. The research assessment exercise, of course, has concentrated by its mm. enormously in saying, mm. well, other people's views matter because mm. at the end of the day, hard cash is dependent mm. on it. So I didn't enjoy that, but gradually I got the confidence of colleagues mm. uh, and uh, I was chairman for five years and I enjoyed that very much. Mm. Um, needed to be done. It was hard work and... Uh, Chair of the faculty? Yeah. Mm. That is, was this before Bob wrote on or after? Not afterwards. Yeah. I don't think he was chairman very long actually. Okay. I think he was mm. only for two years. Mm. And I served for four, 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 five years. Mm. Before me it was uh, um, Willie Brown. Oh, William yes. Brown. And before him it was Frank Hahn. Mm. Has it got better? I mean, you paint a rather dire picture of Cambridge economics. Yes, it has gone better, but you know, uh, ru ruining a department is reasonably easy. You make some really bad appointments mm. and uh, you can do that. Building it up is extremely hard, even if you're interested in making good appointments, mm. people don't apply. Mm. Uh, and uh, I, we suffered from that for a long while. Mm. Things have changed a lot since. You know, mm. it's, uh, but of course, the competition from other departments other universities is greater mm. and so we'll never have the dominance that Cambridge had in the, 30s, in the past. No, no, not even in England, but uh, I mean LSC, University College London, Oxford dominate us mm. and will continue to do so for quite some time I think. Mm. Um, but we are pretty good, I mean I feel very comfortable about the department, we're making good appointments. The best, the issue really is who are applying in whom are you appointing? Mm. You can't fault a department if the best it can appoint, it's able to appoint, mm. is not very good. Because that's a reflection of mm, what others feel about you. You can fault a department for making second-rate appointments when first-rate people had applied. Mm. That's what Cambridge did for about 10-year, 15-year mm. period. And yeah. that, that can, as you know, can have a huge um, I'll stop. <laughs> no, it can have a huge uh, effect for the long run hmm. because you you have um, essentially uh, turned your back on the subject. Hmm. I've got one more very different question, really, which is um, about uh, Asia. I mean. As you know, putting it in a nutshell, most people now think that the dominance of Western Europe and America uh, was a, a small blip uh, between 1890 and 2000, perhaps 200 years. And um, the, it's all tipping back to Asia now, particularly China and India. Do you think this is roughly how it seems? You think about the long term? I don't know. With Forecasting has never been a <laughs> big thing for me. It's hard to know. Um, it's impossible to know, actually. I wouldn't begin to. The thing that's going for the West, if you like, I mean, I have a great deal of, uh, a lot more, I'm a lot more impressed by the Enlightenment than my. Uh, Western colleagues mm. like uh, 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 do because I think I think there is a kind of um, amongst amongst um, social scientists and humanities people certainly in, in Cambridge and elsewhere I mean the liberal left types and I happen to be one of them so mm. but where I differ from my colleagues is in having an urge to show that the Enlightenment really wasn't all that much after all. That what's a big deal about Europe? Um, 
there was China, as we were discussing the great mm. technological inventions in China over millennium. Um, and northern India, southern India had their time. The golden age of India was... The golden age in the Indian history is regarded to be about 4th century, 5th century, 6th century AD, the Gupta mm. period. Yeah. The arts thrived, science thrived. And right through the Middle Ages, there were some pockets of outstanding logicians emerging in Bihar, Bengal area. Many things happened in the South, in mathematics. Then, of course, the, over the long haul, people talk about uh, the caliphates, mm. the 8th, 9th, 10th centuries, which were outstanding periods, mm. and so forth. So, over this period, it's what's so big deal. Uh, and no question, uh, these things have their life cycles, so it'll move somewhere. Mm -hmm. I'm sure of that, because that seems to be the nature of the game. Somebody's not going to be ahead all, mm. all through history. But there's, I think, something distinctive about the Enlightenment, which I don't see, at least in my limited reading of world history, anywhere else in the world, which is a sense in which knowledge was democratized and uh, that people had access to knowledge and there wasn't a barrier. There may be a financial barrier to begin with, but there wasn't a barrier on the basis of caste or some social rigidity which can be absolutely impossible to break. And now there are always exceptions. I'm sure I'll be told that there is some untouchable in northern India who was adopted by the king or somebody <laughs> in Benin and so forth, but uh, mm. we're talking about mass movement rather than uh, the center of gravity moving rather than exceptions. Um, and s the a combination of a liberal attitude to knowledge, the, the dis uh, democratization in the, in the production, dissemination and use of knowledge, if you like, um, and allied to a, an attitude towards science and technology which is based on Literally dispassionate, and then uh, prove me I'm wrong kind of attitude. Mm -hmm. Or if I want to show how good I am, I have to show you how wrong you are attitude kind of thing. It's an empirical test. Seemed to me, now all of these were there in other societies too. Every society that I know of has had in both the mystical side and the rational side simultaneously. Mm -hmm. I don't know of any society, even here we have it, let alone there. <laughs> But there is a sense in which pretty much kind of a daily life is influenced by the, the Enlightenment project. In a way, I don't see it elsewhere quite. Now, it doesn't mean it won't happen elsewhere, but that's something very valuable, and I think that really does keep productivity high. Ideas, and by that I mean the production of ideas. Uh, if you've asked me, you know, is Europe likely to remain a <coughs> world leader in science in 300 years' time, I wouldn't have the faintest idea what it's going to be like then. Because there are incredible number of very bright people in China, India, mm. Sub-Saharan Africa, you name it. Mm. Because again, remember, statistically people are the same. Yeah. That's the hypothesis that we work with. Mm. Uh, but I think the Enlightenment unleashed something I haven't seen anywhere else in my understanding of history. So Jack Goody and I have, we, we are the closest of friends, but I always tease him about that. I say it's all very well to say there have been many renaissance. No doubt, that's true. But there was something distinctive about this one. Uh, what does he say to that? Well, he says, well, you know, he's very fond of me. <laughs> so he would never say I'm wrong. <laughs> but I don't think I convinced him. But the fact remains that it is um, important to realize, uh, to, to remind ourselves that with all the weaknesses in the data, average income didn't really increase until pretty recently in the world, in any part of the world. Um, Angus Madison's 
uh, estimates, mm. which are the only ones that are there, actually, mm. as far as I know. There may be others now coming up, but and there I know are extremely mm. fragile data, no doubt. But that's the best we've got. Mm. Okay, all right. And they're they're useful because they take your attention away from the great mosques and the great temples and the great palaces and the great castles. Because if you see, look at them too long, you start thinking that's the average. Mm. But of course, it's just a tiny bit of the economy sitting out there, the amount that's been expro expropriated by the state mm. or whoever the guy is who is building the mosque. So that's why I take Angus Madison very seriously because it sort of distills away from the big ruins which make you think that, mm. God, there was a great civilization out there. And if you then look for per capita income, um, his publications suggest that not really very much happened till about 14, 1500, in the sense that the big blocks, Asia, Africa, Europe, per capita income grew at a snail's pace. I worked it out to be about 0.002% per year over a 1500 period in most of the world. Now, if you think that where we are now started from about 1500 where we were approximately the same as it was during the Roman period, then you have some explaining to do. And that did not take place in Africa and it did not take place in India and it did not, as far as I know, take place in China. At least his data doesn't suggest that it happened here. So We're coming <laughs> right to the end and that's a very nice <laughs> So that needs to be explained. Challenge. Yes, that needs to be explained. We stop there and sure. thank you very much indeed. Not